Leaving Earth, How to Set Up and Play. I'll be covering the rule set for the combined game, which includes Leaving Earth, Outer Planets, and Stations. First, you lay out all the location cards, matching the sides per the setup diagram in the rules. Also, I'm using the replacement cards that come with stations, as well as the outer planet locations. If there are any locations that are unexplored, shuffle those and just pick one to place on top. All locations in the game are considered to be in space, except for Earth. Next, shuffle and put out the feature decks for the Moon, Venus, Ceres, Phobos, and Mars. Next, set the calendar to 1956. The game will take place over 30 years, ending in 1986. Set out all the advancement cards, as well as the various component cards, shuffle and create an outcomes deck. Create the supply of victory point chips, time tokens, money cards, and set out the eight-sided die. Each player will select a space agency. They will take their set of spacecraft cards that correspond to tokens. They'll also take the various reference cards for the space agency and also have a mission planning pad. You can also set out the joint venture components if you're playing with that feature set. These are not used in a solo game. Finally, you're going to reveal all the setup missions based on the desired difficulty. I'm setting this up for a very hard game, so I have shuffled and randomly have drawn six hard missions, six medium missions, and one easy mission. You're always going to stack the extraterrestrial life survey on top of the life sample mission. The life sample mission is only available once the survey mission is claimed. Every game, regardless of difficulty level, is always going to have one occupation mission. So shuffle the deck of occupation missions and randomly draw one. This will be the standing occupation mission for this game. Next, shuffle the deck of non-explorable missions and draw based on difficulty. For the very hard game, I'm using six of these. Lastly, put out the stacks of explorable missions a matching mission will only be drawn if and when that location is first revealed. A couple of rules about the setup missions. If a second copy of an identical mission is drawn, it's going to be worth extra victory points, 10% extra. So simply take the printed value, divide it by 10, and then round up to the nearest half point. So 12 points divided by 10 is 1.2. We'd round up to one and a half victory points in addition to this. So when this mission is claimed, the claimer will take the card as well as the extra victory point chips. During the game, if and when a mission is ever proven impossible, simply discard the mission without redrawing a replacement. Before we get started, some points about the Solitaire game. It's essentially played the same way as the multiplayer game. When setting up the missions, you're going to use the configuration for hard or very hard. Also, if you draw a duplicate copy of a mission when playing solitaire, you don't put extra victory points, you simply just redraw another mission. In order to win the solo game, by the end of the game, you have to have more victory points than are left in uncompleted missions. Keep in mind, the occupation mission will not count as uncompleted, but any revealed explorable missions will. Each year in Leaving Earth follows a very specific sequence, which we'll cover in more depth later. But at a high level, at the beginning of each year, production will take place. Then all agencies will have their money reset back up to $30 million. Then players can claim any start-of-year missions if they're eligible. Then players will take turns performing the various actions. Then for anything on Earth, there are free repairs. Then we make sure that all astronaut needs are met if they're in space. Then we may do a mental health check for certain astronauts in space. We then remove one time token from any crafts that have a time token on it. Then we reveal and face end of year hazards. And then finally, we advance the calendar or trigger the end of game. 
Let's start by covering all the various actions in the game. So on a player's turn, they can take as many actions as desired in any order and then pass. And then we'd move to the next player. When it gets back around to that player, they can again take as many actions as desired. If on their turn they pass without any actions, they drop out for the year. One of the first actions a player can take is to research one of the advancements in the game. You first check if you meet the prerequisite for the advancement. This one doesn't have a prerequisite, but you can see in order to purchase the synthesis advancement, it requires that you already have the life support advancement. You'll simply pay the money back to the bank, take the advancement card in front of you, and then you'll add the indicated number of outcomes. Most advancements cost $10, You'll see there are some exceptions. The rover only costs three. Also, most of the time you're only placing three outcomes. Again, there are some exceptions. Synthesis, you have five outcome cards randomly placed on this advancement when you purchase it. The rover, five advancement cards. And surveying, only one advancement card. So in this example, the player decided to purchase the Juno Rockets advancement. It didn't have a prerequisite. They paid their $10 and this advancement starts with three random outcomes drawn and placed on top of the advancement. We've covered research. Another action a player can take on their turn is to buy components. To purchase a component, first again, make sure that you meet the prerequisite. So to buy any Juno rockets, the player would have to have the Juno advancement that we just showed in our last example. You'll simply pay the money back to the bank and you take the component cards into your personal supply there is no limit. The next action we'll cover is to assemble or disassemble spacecrafts on Earth. Assembling and disassembling spacecrafts only takes place on Earth. To assemble a spacecraft, select one of your spacecraft cards. These are not limited. You can have unlimited number of spacecraft in the game. Add any desired components that you like. Let's say they decide this player bought a Juno rocket. So they add this one component to the spacecraft, then they take the token and simply place it on Earth. And that's an assembled spacecraft now. To disassemble a spacecraft, simply just remove the component cards, take them back to your personal supply, and return the token back to the spacecraft card. Always keep in mind that if you're adding astronauts, which count as components to your spacecraft, always make sure there are enough seats on the spacecraft to hold the astronauts. And a spacecraft may consist of any components desired, but in order to exist, a spacecraft must contain at least one component. So let's say at any point, the last component card from a spacecraft was exhausted or removed in some way, that spacecraft simply doesn't exist. So you just take that craft token back from the game board. A spacecraft only exists when it has actual components. And as a final reminder, you can only assemble and disassemble spacecrafts on Earth. All other locations in the game are considered to be in space, which would require a rendezvous where you can dock or separate spacecrafts. Next, let's cover maneuvering and all the various maneuver hazards. To perform a maneuver simply means trying to move a spacecraft from one location to another location using one of the indicated maneuvers on the card. You can see from Earth, there are two potential maneuvers for a difficulty of three we can move from Earth to suborbital space. We'd have to face any hazards listed. Here's the suborbital hazard. Or for eight difficulty, we can move directly from Earth to Earth orbit. Some locations may offer multiple maneuvers to the same location with varying levels of difficulty and hazards. So you can see from the Mars cycler, for example, to get to Mars orbit, you have two choices. For a level three difficulty, you can move, and you may also add a time token, or for a level zero difficulty, you can move from Mars Cycler to the Mars orbit, but it requires you to face the arrow braking hazard. Maneuvers typically require thrust in order to propel the spacecraft. The minimum amount of thrust needed is calculated by taking the difficulty multiplied by the mass of the spacecraft. So in this example, you'll remember we assembled a spacecraft with a one Juno rocket, it has a mass of one. So in order to maneuver this spacecraft from Earth to suborbital space, we would take the difficulty of three times the mass of one. We would need a minimum of three thrust. 
this Juno provides four thrust. So by firing this rocket, we would meet the minimum amount of thrust in order to execute that maneuver from Earth to suborbital. So let's complete this simple example of trying to get a single Juno rocket from Earth to suborbital space. The very first step of a maneuver is to fire your rockets to see if you meet the minimum amount of thrust. We've calculated that we should have enough thrust, but our Juno technology, since it still has outcome cards on it, is not fully tested. So there's some inherent risk. So when attempting to fire the rocket, we shuffle any remaining outcome cards still on the advancement. We flip over one and we can see this is a success. So we now reference the advancement card. We can see a success. The rocket gets discarded and it provides thrust. So because this was a success, we can simply discard this rocket. It provided the four thrust. Remember we needed a minimum of three. One mass times the difficulty of three. So this craft was able to propel itself from Earth to suborbital space. The Juno rocket simply gets discarded, but you'll remember in order for a craft to exist, it has to have components. So since this craft no longer has any components, this craft ceases to exist and that token can simply be removed. Normally you would only do a maneuver like that without any payload if you're trying to test your advancements. So let's talk about testing. Once this success got resolved, the player agency has a decision to make. They can pay $10 to take this success card and remove it and just discard it. The reason why they would do that is because now they're one step closer to ensuring complete testing of the Juno rockets. If they decide not to pay that $10, this would simply get put back into the stack of outcomes and the next time we fired a Juno rocket, this would get reshuffled and we would draw a random outcome. So by removing successes, you're trying to get rid of all the outcome cards to ensure that there isn't a hidden failure in this outcomes deck. For example, let's rewind. What if when firing this Juno rocket, we shuffled our outcomes deck and the card we drew was a minor failure? We can see on a minor failure for a rocket, the rocket gets damaged and it provides no thrust. So we would simply take the rocket we were trying to fire, flip it over, no thrust was generated in order to propel that spacecraft. And then after that was executed, we can see to remove a minor failure only cost $5. And it always gets removed after the effects. So it doesn't change the outcome, but it gives us the ability to now remove this from the deck. And let's look at the final example. What if when firing a Juno rocket, we drew a card and it was a major failure? We can see on a major failure, the explosion destroys the entire spacecraft. So all the rockets on the card, along with any other components, would simply get discarded and that spacecraft would get destroyed. And again, to remove a major failure after the effects are resolved, costs $5 to remove this from the outcomes deck. So normally when testing rockets, that's why you'd only test and fire one at a time, because you don't want to risk a major failure destroying the entire craft along with other valuable components that you've purchased. But let's say we fire one Juno rocket. We can see it was a major failure, so it provided no thrust. The entire craft got blown up. We pay the $5 to remove that outcome. We now assemble another spacecraft on Earth with one Juno rocket. We want to fire it. We would reshuffle these cards, draw another outcome. So the rocket provides no thrust and it gets damaged, so we simply turn it over. We pay $5 to remove the minor failure. And let's say we assemble another spacecraft with a brand new Juno rocket and we want to do the final test. We launch it, we flip this over, and we see it's a success. When a success is the final card, it can be automatically removed for free. You don't have to pay the $10. You can see that when an advancement has no cards, no outcome cards left on it, it's an automatic success whenever triggering that advancement. Let's look at another simple maneuver example. Let's say we've assembled the spacecraft on Earth because we want to get five spare parts and five food up to Earth orbit. So we can see we have a mass of 10, a difficulty of eight, since we want to go straight from Earth to Earth orbit. So we take 10 times eight, so that's an 80. Now let's say we bought a Saturn rocket. We can see a Saturn rocket provides 200 thrust. So that seems like enough. But you can't forget that the rockets themselves have mass. So if this was the spacecraft you assembled thinking that that was enough mass, you now have to recalculate. 20, 
plus 10, you now have 30 total mass times a difficulty of 8, so that's 240. So that one Saturn rocket is not going to be enough to propel this. So that's why it's very useful to use these mission planning cards because they'll actually help you calculate the thrust with the rockets factored in already supporting themselves. It's this payload mass card that will show you all the various types of rockets that provide thrust and you can cross-reference that with the difficulty of the maneuver. So we know we're trying to move from Earth to Earth orbit, so it's a difficulty of 8. So we look at this row to find out a Soyuz with a difficulty of 8, in addition to it itself, can also support one mass of payload. A Saturn can support five mass payload. So we know we're trying to get 10 mass from Earth to Earth orbit at a difficulty of 8. If we use two Saturns, that should be enough. Two Saturns could support 10 mass payload plus itself. So let's see if our calculation worked. We have added two Saturns to this assembled spacecraft on Earth. So now we have a total mass of 20, 40, 50. So the difficulty is now 8 times 50 mass which would be 400 thrust needed to propel this. We look at the thrust provided, we can see that the two Saturns provide exactly 400 thrust. So we've perfectly calculated this. Now we need to fire the Saturn rockets. If your Saturn technology isn't fully tested, we have to obviously shuffle the cards, draw a random outcome, it's a success. So at least the first Saturn rocket provided its 200 thrust. Now we have two Saturn rockets, so now we have to fire the second one. So we can decide, do we want to pay $10 to remove this success outcome? Maybe we don't. We won't pay that. So these will get reshuffled again, and then you'll draw an outcome card for the second one. And now, assuming it's a success, we've now generated the 400 thrust needed to propel this spacecraft. The two Saturn rockets would get discarded, and this craft would get propelled to Earth orbit where it's existing now with the food and the parts. But you can see, if a technology hasn't fully been tested, the first rocket may have been a success, and maybe the second rocket fired was a minor failure, meaning it just got damaged and provided no thrust, but that total spacecraft now did not meet the minimum amount of thrust to make the entire maneuver. Or even worse, maybe the second rocket fired was a major failure and exploded and destroyed the entire spacecraft. So as we've seen in these examples, any spacecraft may attempt a maneuver regardless of its components. The very first step is to fire the rockets. One at a time, you evaluate the outcome. You potentially discard the rockets. If the minimum amount of thrust is achieved, you face any hazards on the card, and then you move the craft to the new location. If the minimum thrust isn't achieved, you stay put where you are. And since we've been mentioning possible maneuver hazards, now let's cover all the potential maneuver hazards that you may face in the game. So the first hazard we can see whenever maneuvering from Earth to suborbital or to Earth orbit is this suborbital space hazard. It's important to keep in mind the reason why there's an astronaut icon in there. The hazard is only evaluated when an astronaut moves from Earth either to suborbital or through suborbital to Earth's orbit. The suborbital hazard will have no effect on an unmanned mission. So in our example of testing the Juno rockets or using some Saturns to get supplies to Earth orbit, since no astronauts are on board, we did not face the suborbital space hazard. But any time a crewed vehicle leaves Earth with astronauts, either to suborbital or through suborbital space, they have to face the suborbital hazard. The first time that that happens, we simply would take the one card that was selected during setup and flip it over and then look at the effects. So in this game, since this was the card selected, spaceflight has no ill effects on humans. We, so now we know that humans can safely go to suborbital and through suborbital space. In future games, you may have a suborbital space card that gets revealed. And we can see the hazard here is that every time that we send an astronaut through suborbital space or to suborbit, we have to roll a die per astronaut. And if we roll a one, that astronaut gets incapacitated. So the effects of explored locations are going to change each game based on the random card drawn. Just keep in mind that once you reveal the hazard, this is now in effect for the remainder of this game. 
Next, let's cover atmospheric re-entry, represented by this cloud. This is only going to affect capsules that are capable of protecting astronauts. All other components are unaffected by this cloud hazard. So in this example, moving from Earth orbit back down to Earth, we can see it's a difficulty of zero. So regardless of the mass, mass times zero is always going to be zero, so no thrust is required. So we don't have to worry about calculating that. We're simply going to drop this capsule from Earth orbit directly to Earth. We always face the hazards in the order listed on the card. So we first have to face the atmospheric re-entry hazard if our spacecraft contains capsules. Here are the six different space capsules in the game capable of protecting astronauts in space. We can see with these first three, the Eagle, the Aldrin, and the Space Habitat, if they're ever facing the atmospheric re-entry hazard, they instantly burn up. They have no chance to survive. These other three space capsules, the Vostok, the Apollo, and the Space Shuttle, each have a heat shield. You can see that whenever they face the atmospheric re-entry hazard, they'll burn up unless re-entry is successful. Re-entry is an advancement. So when these capsules with heat shields face the cloud icon, we would draw a random outcome. On a success, the re-entry was successful. On a minor failure, the capsule is damaged, but any astronaut occupants will survive. And on a major failure, that capsule is destroyed and any occupants inside of that specific capsule die. If you have multiple capsules facing the re-entry hazard, remember to declare which capsule your astronaut is in. So in this example, we have two capsules that both have the heat shield, so they can both draw for re-entry. We would declare that maybe Neil Armstrong is in the Apollo, because based on the outcome, if we had a major failure, the astronaut would die with the capsule. If and when astronauts ever die in the game, you simply take them and tuck them in your play area. They're going to count as negative victory points at the end of the game. One other point, if you ever have a capsule with a heat shield that for whatever reason was damaged, you can see the heat shield no longer functions. So if this Vostok had to face re-entry, it would simply burn up. It does not get to draw a re-entry card. Next, let's cover the landing hazard. Remember, you always face hazards in order. So first we'd face atmospheric re-entry, and then we'd possibly face landing. You can see it's in parentheses. That means it's an optional hazard. So the player can decide whether they want to face that hazard. They may decide they do not have the landing advancement. So they choose not to face the landing hazard because it's in parentheses, and they just splash down in the ocean. Just keep in mind that any spacecraft, regardless of components, Whenever it faces the landing hazard, unless you have the landing advancement, it's going to get destroyed. But if you have the landing advancement, you can draw an outcome. And we can see on a success, the landing was successful. On a minor failure, it was a rough landing, but you have to damage one chosen component on the spacecraft. And if it was a major failure, you actually impact with the surface and the entire spacecraft is destroyed. It's also important to note here that you can see the pilot symbol here. So if you have a pilot on board, Neil Armstrong, for example, is a pilot, they will improve one level up the outcome drawn. So if we were to draw maybe a major failure from this deck, since we have a pilot on board, that moves it up to only a minor failure. So we have a rough landing and we just have to damage one chosen component. So pilots are valuable because you can see they give a plus one to landing, and later we'll see they give a plus one when trying to execute a rendezvous. So let's complete this example. We're trying to execute the landing maneuver. We have one outcome card left. We draw it, it's a major failure. We have a pilot on board, fortunately. So this moves up to a minor failure. So we have a rough landing. We have to damage one chosen component. So we pick a component on the spacecraft and we could just flip it over. As long as it has a damaged side, it's eligible. Astronauts count because they have an incapacitated side. If you're ever able to damage a component based on an outcome, if there are no eligible ones left to damage, the entire craft gets destroyed. So to complete this example, we'll choose to damage the Vostok capsule based on the rough landing. We're now safely on Earth. We'll pay the $5 to remove this outcome card. Now we know landing is fully tested, so every time we have to draw, it's an automatic success.
Next, let's cover multi-year maneuvers, which are represented by this hourglass icon. So for example, to move from Earth orbit to Mars orbit, we first have to satisfy the thrust requirement, so a five difficulty multiplied by the mass. Then we're gonna to have to face the solar radiation hazard, which we'll talk about later. And then we're gonna add one time icon for each hourglass listed. So once we do those things in order, we'll move that craft to the new location and put three time tokens on it. You can put the time tokens directly on the craft token or directly on the spacecraft card. We know at the end of the year, there's a step where one time token will get removed from each spacecraft that has one on it. So this spacecraft has not technically arrived at this location until all time tokens have been removed. So until all tokens are gone, this spaceship can't maneuver, it can't survey, it can't dock with other crafts, nor can it collect any samples. Once the spacecraft has had its last time token removed during this step in the year, then it has officially arrived. You'll resolve any remaining hazards in order. Here's another example that shows some potential timing. Let's say we were heading from Jupiter orbit to Io. Once we satisfy the thrust requirement, we see that we immediately face the Jupiter hazard. So we'd go to the Jupiter hazard, reveal the card, and face that. Then we see we have the option, since it's in parentheses, to place time tokens on this spacecraft. If we decide not to exercise that option, we would immediately resolve the landing hazard and then the IO hazard itself by revealing the IO card. Let's say instead we do exercise our option to make this a longer journey. So from Jupiter orbit to Io, as always, we have to satisfy the thrust requirement. We immediately face the Jupiter hazard. We have the option of putting one or more time tokens on this craft. So we're gonna move it to Io. Let's say we decide to just add one type token. When that token gets revealed, that's when we'll have to now face landing on Io and then the Io hazard itself. Anytime a maneuver shows at least one time icon, either in parentheses or required, the player has the option to add as many time icons as desired to that craft. Now the maneuver has to have at least one time icon. If a maneuver like this one doesn't have a time icon, the player doesn't have that option. The reason why you would want to add additional time icons is because of a special type of a rocket called an ion thruster. An ion thruster is a reusable rocket for each ion thruster aboard your spacecraft is going to provide five thrust per year or per time token. You still have to draw outcomes whenever you fire your ion thrusters. On a success, it's going to provide the thrust. On a minor failure, it's going to be damaged and provide no thrust. Also on a major failure, same outcome. It gets damaged and provides no thrust. And just like you have the option to go slower by adding time tokens, you also have the option to go faster. You have to make this decision before generating thrust. In order to go faster, you can cut the time in half, but you have to double the difficulty. So for example, to go from Earth orbit to Mars flyby, we could go in half the time. We always round up. So this would go from 3 to 1.5, rounded up to 2 years but we'd have to double the difficulty up to six. Now we can repeat that process. So we can take the two years, cut it in half down to one year, but we'd have to double that six difficulty to a 12. So we could use a 12 difficulty, but only take one year to get from Earth orbit to the Mars flyby. Next, let's talk about solar radiation. One interesting thing about solar radiation, you're always gonna face it at the start of a maneuver. So for example, making this maneuver to the Saturn flyby, even though it's going to take three years, you put those time tokens on the craft, you move it to the location, you're immediately going to face the solar radiation when you start the maneuver. You're not going to wait until the time tokens are removed. When facing the solar radiation hazard, you're going to reveal this card. Other planets may have radiation effects, but this is the one that pertains to radiation from the sun. So you would simply turn this over, and these effects would be in effect for the remainder of the game. Radiation can affect both astronauts as well as probes and capsules. It can also be affected by the duration of the maneuver if there's an hourglass symbol listed. So for example, 
this radiation for each astronaut, you can see it's three times the length of a maneuver. So let's say the maneuver was two years or two hourglasses. You would take three times two or six. So for each astronaut, they'd have to roll higher than a six or they're going to get sick or incapacitated. So they have to outroll the level of radiation. If there was no hourglass symbol on the icon, they would simply just take the number. So they'd have to roll higher than a three to avoid becoming sick. The same thing goes for each probe or capsule that's exposed to the radiation. So in this example, it's one times the duration of the maneuver. So again, let's say it was a two year maneuver. So each probe and capsule would have to roll higher than a two to avoid becoming damaged. If it did get damaged, you'd flip it over to its other side. If there was no hourglass symbol, again, you're just trying to outroll the base number. Make sure before each die roll, you're declaring which astronaut or which probe and capsule you're rolling for. Later, we'll talk about healing incapacitated astronauts, but you're not allowed to heal until all astronauts have rolled for radiation. Here are some components that provide radiation modifiers. The space habitat converts all radiation to zero, protecting all of its occupants. The ground habitat does the same, converting radiation to zero. The Galileo probe provides a minus one modifier for itself, and the Aldrin capsule provides a minus one modifier for itself and its occupants. You would basically apply this modifier to the printed value on the card before doing the calculation and rolls. Next, let's talk about the aero braking hazard. This means you're approaching a planet at high speed and using part of its atmosphere to slow you down. If you do not have the aero braking advancement, your spacecraft will be destroyed. If you do have the aero braking advancement, you can draw outcomes. On a success, the aero braking was successful. On a minor failure, you have to damage a chosen component, and then your spacecraft will immediately face the atmospheric reentry hazard. On a major failure, the spacecraft is destroyed. You'll notice that even to get the aero braking advancement, you had to first have the reentry advancement. Next is the automatic maneuver hazard shown by this exclamation mark. No thrust is ever required to perform an automatic maneuver. You may perform it during your turn or at the end of your turn, if a spacecraft is in a location with an automatic maneuver, this will happen automatically. And keep in mind, this happens at the end of a player's turn, not at the end of a year. So for example, any spacecraft in the lunar flyby location at the end of a player's turn will become lost automatically, meaning it gets destroyed. There's another set of locations known as the Earth and Mars Cycler that will allow a spacecraft to maneuver back and forth without any thrust because of the automatic maneuver. So for example, when a spacecraft maneuvers into the Earth Cycler, if it's still there at the end of its turn, it will automatically perform this maneuver, meaning it'll face solar radiation, it'll get three time tokens on it, and it'll get moved to the Mars Cycler. Once those time tokens are removed, if it doesn't make any effort to exit out of the Mars Cycler, it will automatically execute this maneuver and maneuver back to the Earth Cycler, continuing that process until on its turn, it makes the effort to exit the cyclers. Next, let's cover slingshot maneuvers. These are special maneuvers to the outer planets of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune that are only available in certain years because they require planetary alignment. This maneuver, for example, has the destination symbol and color of Jupiter. So you have to consult the calendar to see when this maneuver is eligible. So here on the calendar, we can see which slingshot maneuvers are eligible in which year. For example, if this was 1964, we can see that Jupiter and Neptune slingshot maneuvers are available. If this was 1965, we can see no slingshot maneuvers are eligible. Another useful tool is this Windows Maneuver Chart. This is going to show you where you need to be and when you need to be there in order to get where you want to go. So for example, if we wanted to reach Saturn in 1983, it shows the preceding maneuvers that have to be made in which years. So for example, to get to Saturn in 83, you're going to need to fly by Jupiter in 1981, which means you need to fly by Venus in 1980, which means you need to leave Earth orbit by 1978.
You'll also notice that if you leave Earth in 1972, there is a single journey that will allow you to reach every single outer planet. Let's see how that works. So here we can see if we leave Earth orbit in 1972, it's going to take one year to get to the inner planet's transfer, and then from there it's going to take another year to get to the Venus flyby. So now we're at the Venus flyby in 1974, and we can depart for the Jupiter flyby, which is going to take one year. Here we arrive at the Jupiter flyby in 1975, which allows us to depart for the Saturn flyby. The same maneuver rules still apply for slingshot maneuvers, so when executing this, you'll have to first face the Jupiter hazard, then you would add the two time tokens, you would immediately face the solar radiation. The nice thing is the difficulty is zero, so no thrust is required. Departing here in 1975 allows you to get to the Saturn flyby in 1977, which allows you to depart for Uranus, which is going to take five years. Once you reach Uranus in 1982, you can make the final slingshot maneuver to Neptune, which takes an additional four years, finally arriving at Neptune in 1986. So there you can see how the grand tour would work by departing Earth in 1972 and reaching all those outer planet destinations by 1986. You'll notice there are other locations like the outer planets transfer that also offer slingshot maneuvers that take different amounts of time. Just make sure that the slingshot maneuver that you're trying to make is eligible in the year you're trying to make it. And one very important rule is that whenever you're making a slingshot maneuver, you have to use the exact amount of time listed, no more or no less. Next, let's talk about other exploration hazards and exploring features. You'll remember that when performing a maneuver, you have to face the hazards in order. So moving from lunar orbit to the moon, you'd first face the landing hazard, and then you would face the actual moon itself by revealing this card. You actually have an option. You can reveal the card and face the effects, or you may decide to leave the card face down after looking at it, but then you would have to destroy your spacecraft. So that would keep the card secret to other players. You would know it, but you would have to sacrifice your spacecraft in order to do that. There's also another action that we'll talk about later called surveying that lets you look at location cards from an adjacent location. But in this example, let's just assume we're maneuvering our spacecraft from lunar orbit down to the moon. We're going to reveal this card. Whatever local conditions are present on the card, we would follow. You'll also notice that some of the inner planet locations have features that can be explored. In order to explore a feature, first the location must already be revealed. There has to be room for another feature and you have to still have cards left in the deck. Assuming those conditions are met, there are two ways to explore a feature. The first is to maneuver a working probe or capsule to the revealed location. The second is to use a separated rover that's already on the surface of the location. So let's cover the first example. Let's say this location was already revealed and we were maneuvering a working probe or capsule. That would allow us to reveal one feature we would simply draw it off the top of the deck and its effects apply immediately. There are three types of features that you'll encounter. The first are conditions that will stay in effect at the location. The second type are components that can be picked up by a working probe, capsule, or astronaut. And the third type represent victory points. These can also be immediately picked up by the player that revealed it. And once a feature card gets picked up, it no longer counts towards the maximum at the location, allowing another feature to be explored here. Now let's talk about the second way we can explore a feature. If we already have a rover on the surface of the location, we can split it into a separate spacecraft using the rendezvous advancement, which we'll talk about. We'll see that when we have a rover, when it's separate, it may attempt to explore a feature. It's going to require the rover advancement. When we purchase the rover advancement, we add five outcome cards to it, and whenever the rover attempts to explore, we actually draw two random outcomes. If we get two success cards, we get to explore a feature, but the rover is done for the year. Anything else, nothing happens, and the rover is done for the year. If we happen to draw a major failure, 
along with another card, the rover gets damaged. But let's assume this was fully tested, so we get a success and the rover gets to explore a feature. Again, we just reveal one at the location. This feature counts as a sample or a component that a working probe, capsule, or astronaut can pick up. We can see that if we get it back to Earth, it has monetary value. So by picking it up, it leaves room for another feature to be explored. So let's assume another year passed, we split our rover again, and it was able to explore another feature. Here we can see nothing interesting discovered, so this card cannot be picked up. So now this location is at its maximum number of features. One final rule about exploring features. If you have a pilot anywhere at the location when exploring a feature, that allows you to draw two cards from the top of the features deck. You look at them, you select which one to place face up. The one not selected would go at the bottom of the deck. Now that we've covered maneuvering and all the various hazard interactions that can happen when maneuvering, let's cover the remaining actions, starting with the dock and separate action. In order to dock or separate spacecrafts, they have to be in the same location. You'll notice that there is no docking or separating in suborbital space, nor is there docking or separating on Earth. You also need the rendezvous advancement in order to attempt on a success, your docking and separating is successful. On either a minor or a major failure, there is no docking or separating, and you have to damage a chosen component. You'll also notice that the pilot gives you a plus one on rendezvous, so it can convert a major into a minor or a minor into a success. Let's start with docking first. In order to dock, you're simply going to join one spacecraft to another. Neither of the crafts can have time tokens on them. You're simply going to take the component cards from one craft and add them to the other. So this craft has now docked with this one. All the component cards are on that spacecraft, and you can take this token back and just put it here. Next, let's cover separating. To separate, you're simply going to divide a spacecraft into multiple spacecrafts. So just take an unused craft token and place it in the same location, and then you would move whatever components you want to from the craft onto the new craft. And unlike docking, you are allowed to separate a spacecraft even if it has time tokens on it. So let's say this spacecraft had one time token on it, and we want to split off some components. We would simply add the new craft like normal, but we put an equal number of time tokens on the separated spacecraft. There is a special rule for rendezvous testing. Because on your turn you have unlimited actions, you could continue to dock and separate a single component, continuing to draw success outcomes over and over and over again until you had confidence there wasn't a hidden failure in your outcomes deck. Because of that, there's a rule called full rendezvous testing. So on your turn, when attempting to dock or separate, you would simply declare that you're doing full rendezvous testing. You would reveal one outcome at a time until you encounter a failure. Once you encounter a failure, the full rendezvous testing stops. You have to resolve the failure, so we know that you would have to damage a chosen component. You could pay to remove the outcome, like normal, to get it out of your outcomes deck. Any cards you didn't pay to remove would simply go back into the deck. Those would get reshuffled and you, you could declare I'm doing full rendezvous testing again. Reshuffle your deck, and again, you draw one outcome at a time until you encounter a failure. Resolve the failure, pay to remove it, and we know once we only have one success left on the advancement, it gets removed automatically for free. Next, we'll cover surveying. This allows you to use a working probe or capsule to look at an adjacent location. We've already seen the various capsules in the game. Here are the probes that can be used for surveying. So let's assume that this spacecraft had a working probe or capsule on board. It can survey any adjacent hazard. So from this location, since it's maneuver adjacent to Mars, it can look at the Mars location. 
It's also maneuver adjacent to Phobos. It could also look at the Phobos location card. In order to attempt the survey, you also have to have the surveying advancement, which starts with one outcome on it. On a success, you get to look at the other side of the location card that you are attempting to survey. On a minor or a major failure, the surveying simply fails. Also remember that each prober capsule can only survey once per turn. Any hazard that's maneuver adjacent can be surveyed. So for example, if we had a working probe or capsule in Earth orbit, it could survey the solar radiation hazard. The only exception, as you'll remember, is the suborbital space. This cannot be surveyed from Earth. It's only revealed when sending a astronaut either to it or through it. You're also allowed to survey any location listed with this telescope icon. So if I had a spacecraft in the Jupiter flyby with a working probe or capsule, I could attempt to survey any of these listed locations next to the telescope icon. And always at the end of a player's turn, any automatic maneuvers get executed. A couple final rules about surveying. First, you're never allowed to survey with a spacecraft if it still has time tokens on it. Also, when you're looking at the location card, you can decide whether to turn it face up or leave it face down. If you leave it face down, you're not allowed to claim any associated missions by looking at it. Also, you can test your surveying by looking at locations that have already been explored. And then finally, we've seen that locations can get auto-explored when maneuvering your craft to them. Next is the collect sample action. This is gonna require a working probe, capsule, or astronaut on a solid body. You simply take a sample card from the location and add it to your spacecraft. So in this example, with a spacecraft on the moon, I could use a working probe, capsule, or astronaut to simply take one moon sample card and add it to my spacecraft. Next, let's cover repair. If I have a mechanic present, they can use one spare part to repair all damage on the spacecraft. So in this example, since I have a mechanic on board the spacecraft, they can use this spare part to repair all damaged components. We would flip them to their normal side and the spare part would get consumed and discarded. Next is the heal action, which allows a doctor on board to heal all astronauts by using one medical supply or having a medical module on board. So in this example, I've got a doctor on board this spacecraft that can use this medical supply to heal any and all incapacitated astronauts. They get flipped over to their healthy side and the medical supply simply gets discarded. A doctor could also use a medical module if it was on board to heal all others for free without having to use a medical supply. Just remember in any case, doctors are never allowed to heal themselves. They'd have to be healed by another doctor. The final action you can do on your turn is cooperate with other space agencies. This allows players to exchange money, spacecrafts, research, and components. In fact, if you exchange an advancement or a component that requires an advancement, you now automatically get that advancement with the same number of outcome cards on it. Okay, now that we've covered everything that can happen during player turns, let's cover the entire year sequence from start to finish. The first thing that happens at the start of the year is production. Hydroponics can make food, generators can make small fuel, and mechanics can build ground habitats. Let's cover hydroponics first. The hydroponics module requires a healthy astronaut to operate it. You're going to draw from the synthesis advancement, which starts with five outcomes, and on a success, you simply make one food and add one food card to the spacecraft. Next is the fuel generator. It requires a spare part present on the spacecraft. It also has to be in a location where carbon dioxide is present in the atmosphere. It uses the synthesis advancement. On a success, the spare part gets converted and consumed into a small fuel tank that gets added to the spacecraft. Synthesis is used for both the fuel generator and the hydroponics module. On a minor failure, nothing happens. On a major failure, either the generator or the hydroponics would get damaged. The final item during production 
is you can build a ground habitat. You have to have the parts for the ground habitat and you have to have a mechanic astronaut in order to build it. You simply use your mechanic to flip the parts over to the built ground habitat. After the production steps, we move on to funding. All agencies get their money reset back to 30. Keep in mind, this funding happens after production. So any money that you may want to use to remove outcomes when drawing from synthesis for either hydroponics or the fuel generator would have had to been saved from the prior year. Next, agencies can claim start of year missions. There are some missions that can only be claimed at the start of the year. For example, man on the moon at the start of the year. The agency that completes this can claim this card for end game victory points. If multiple agencies have completed the objective in the same start of year, it would go to the agency with the fewest victory points. Whenever missions are claimed throughout the game, other agencies that didn't claim the mission immediately receive $10 million of funding. This is just a reminder that this also applies to start of year missions. You also want to check the occupation mission for this game. Multiple agency can claim the victory point ships if they meet the requirement. This doesn't count as claiming a card, so other agencies aren't awarded the $10 million of additional funding. Next, we go to the player turns and actions, which we've covered. We start with the player with the fewest victory points, and then we simply go clockwise. As a reminder, players on their turn can take as many actions in any order as desired. Remember that automatic maneuvers execute at the end of a player's turn. And once a player passes without any actions on their turn, they drop out of the year until all pass. Next, we get free repairs on Earth. So any damaged components that are on Earth automatically get repaired. Also, any incapacitated astronauts on Earth automatically get healed. Next, we check all astronauts that are off Earth in space. If any astronaut in space is still incapacitated, they immediately die. Next, we see if astronauts have working life support. Each undamaged capsule in space can provide life support if the agency has the life support advancement and the outcome succeeds for each capsule. We can see on a success, the occupants survive, but on a minor or a major failure, the occupants die. We can also see that if a mechanic is present, it provides a plus one to the outcome. Also keep in mind that life support is only checked when a capsule ends the year in space. So in order to have money to remove outcomes, You'll need to save that from the player turns until we get down to the life support check. And finally, you need to feed all astronauts. One food component can feed up to five astronauts on the same spacecraft. Also keep in mind that hydroponics produce food at the start of the year. So if you are sending an astronaut on a mission with a hydroponics module, make sure that you have the food to feed them until the hydroponics gets a chance to produce new food. Next, we perform a mental health check on every astronaut in space if they're alone or their capsule is greater than 50% occupied. On a roll of a one, they'll become incapacitated. On everything else, it'll be a success. So for example, if this astronaut was alone, we'd have to roll for mental health. Or if there was another astronaut in their capsule, and we can see this is greater than 50% occupied, we'd have to roll mental health for both these astronauts. Next, we remove one time token from all crafts that still have time tokens on it. So here, we can remove one. We can see it's still traveling to its destination. This craft will get its final time token removed, meaning now it's arrived at its destination. It will now immediately face any remaining hazards, which will be landing on Ceres, and the actual series location hazard. One last point about removing time tokens. If you are removing the last time token from a craft and it's now arriving at its location, facing its final hazards, you may be able to immediately claim any missions during this step that were accomplished. And as normal, any agencies that weren't able to claim the mission get $10 million immediately. Next, we face year end hazards. Some outer planet locations have that icon on it, meaning that it'll be a hazard that affects all spacecrafts at that location, even ones with time tokens on it. 
Here's an example of a location with an end of year hazard. All spacecraft at this location, even if they have time tokens on it, are subject to end of year hazards. So if this hasn't already been revealed, we would reveal the hazard and subject all spacecrafts to the effects. Finally, we advance the calendar to the next year. The game will end at this point if we've moved past 1986, or if there are no more missions left to claim, or an agency has an unbeatable lead. The winner of the game is going to be the agency with the most victory points after counting any negative victory points for lost astronauts. So let's see how to qualify for all the various missions in the game. So whenever an agency meets the requirements for a mission, they can claim it, whether it's in their turn or at the start of the year. Whenever a mission card gets claimed, all other agencies that didn't claim the mission get an instant $10 million of additional funding. If there are duplicate missions, the agency that completes it first can claim either, along with the victory point chips on the card. They're just not allowed to claim the second duplicate mission if they achieve the requirement again. And always remember, if and when a mission is ever proven impossible, simply discard it without a redraw. The first types of missions are the survey missions. These can be claimed simply by revealing the location, either through the surveying action or by maneuvering a spacecraft and facing the hazard and revealing the location. Some survey missions require you to reveal multiple locations. It's the agency that reveals the final location that's able to claim the mission card, even if they weren't the same agency to reveal some of the others. Now's a good time to talk about these explorable missions. An explorable mission only gets drawn if and when that location is first revealed. You're only going to draw one random mission, and to be draw eligible, it must match at least one symbol on the revealed location card. So as an example, the first time we reveal the Enceladus location, it gets flipped over, and we see which missions are eligible to get drawn. We look for this symbol. There may be one symbol, there may be multiple symbols. Here's only an alpha symbol. So we look at the explorable Enceladus missions, and the only ones eligible are the ones with the alpha symbol. So these ones are ineligible because they don't have the symbol. We would take these two missions, shuffle them completely, and just draw one. And this is now the Enceladus Explorable mission. It is possible to instantly satisfy missions when they're first revealed. For example, this mission requires you to survey the Enceladus location with a Galileo probe. So if this location was revealed by an agency that used the Galileo probe, they would instantly satisfy this and could claim it. Any advanced survey missions in the game are always completed by the agency that first uses a Galileo probe to survey the indicated location, even if it was already revealed. Also keep in mind that in a solo game, any revealed explorable missions will count against the victory point total that you're trying to beat. The rules also recommend that as part of setup, at lower difficulty levels, you remove some of the higher victory point missions. There's another type of mission called an explorer mission. This requires you to have a spacecraft at the indicated location that consists of a working explorer payload and nothing else. So you'll have to separate prior, you'll discard the spacecraft and the explorer payload, and you'll be able to claim the mission. Another mission type is a sample return mission. These are completed by collecting a sample from the indicated location and getting it returned to Earth. These can also be completed by getting that sample to a scientist on board a science module for examination. Another type of mission is an experiment mission. To complete an experiment, you need a scientist at the indicated location with a science module and a ready experiment. So in this example, we need a scientist on Venus with a science module. We would take the ready experiment, flip it over to the finished side, which completes the experiment. Now we just need to get the finished experiment back to Earth to claim the mission. As we saw in setup, the ET survey mission always starts on top of the ET sample mission. The ET sample mission is not available until we reveal extraterrestrial life, nor would those victory points be counted against you in a solo game. The survey mission can be claimed if and when 
life is discovered in the solar system. Once the ET survey mission is claimed, it now makes the ET sample mission available. This can be satisfied by getting a sample of the extraterrestrial life either back to Earth or by getting it examined by a scientist astronaut in a science module. As we talked about during the year sequence, there are some missions that require you to meet them at the start of the year. For example, man on moon at the start of the year. This can only be satisfied during the year sequence when we get to the year start missions. And we've talked about the occupation mission. Each game will have one occupation mission available. Instead of claiming the mission card, the point tokens are awarded at the start of the year to any and all agencies with an astronaut in that location. The final type of mission to mention are the man and back missions. This requires you to get an astronaut to the indicated location and then safely back on Earth. A man and back mission can also be satisfied if you can get the astronaut back to a space or a ground habitat. All the other missions you'll encounter in the game are self-explanatory. For example, get a working probe or capsule onto Mercury, get a working ground habitat on Venus, and get a working space habitat into Mars orbit. When calculating your game and victory points, include all victory points from mission cards, any victory point tokens earned, any victory points from feature cards, and don't forget to take negative victory points for any astronauts that were killed during service. This is cumulative. So for the first astronaut lost, it's minus two, then minus four, then minus six. So losing three astronauts would be negative 12 points at the end of the game. Before we finish, I want to quickly recap the different propulsion systems in the game. These are the different types of discardable rockets and the thrust that each one provides. The advancements for these all work the same. A success, the rocket provides thrust, but it gets discarded. On a minor failure, there is no thrust and the rocket gets damaged. And on a major failure, the entire craft explodes. Also notice that to acquire the Proton rocket's advancement, you must first have the Soyuz rocket's advancement. We saw that ion thrusters provide reusable thrust, five thrust per year of the maneuver. Each ion thruster can only be fired once per year, and they only provide thrust when maneuvers are taking one year or more. Two other reusable systems are the space shuttle and the Daedalus rocket which require you to discard fuel in order to provide thrust. We can see that they share the same advancement, the space shuttle advancement, which requires you to first have re-entry and atlas advancements in order to purchase this. You're gonna draw an outcome whenever the shuttle or the Daedalus is fired. On a success, the engine provides thrust, the fuel is consumed, discarded. On a minor failure, the engine gets damaged, you get to keep the fuel, no thrust is created, and on a major failure, the explosion destroys the entire spacecraft. To power the space shuttle, you have to discard a large fuel tank. To power the Daedalus rocket, you have to discard a small fuel tank. It's important to remember that each engine can only consume one fuel tank per maneuver. There is an upcoming designer revision to the game the large fuel tank is going to have its mass changed to 6 and its cost changed to 6. The Daedalus rocket is going to have its thrust changed to 22. And because of that revision, the payload chart for both the shuttle and the Daedalus will change because for both of these, the engine and the fuel tank are factored into the max payload that they can carry at each difficulty level. Another part of the upcoming revision affects the fuel generator. I noted this in the subtitles when we talked about production. The fuel generator is going to have its mass changed to 1, and the requirement to use a spare part to create fuel is going to be removed. Spare part is no longer going to be required. The designer is going to put out an upgrade kit covering all these changes. One final note, when planning complex missions, use the mission planning pad you always plan your maneuvers in reverse. So for example, if we were trying to get an astronaut all the way from Earth to the moon and then safely back home, we start with the final maneuver. We know that to get from Earth orbit back to Earth isn't gonna require any thrust. 
So the last maneuver that's going to require thrust is from lunar orbit to Earth orbit at a difficulty of three. So think about how much payload is coming home on that final maneuver. Maybe it's just the Vostok capsule. So you would reference your payload chart based on the difficulty, figure out which rockets you want to use, calculate the mass of those rockets, and now you add that to the preceding stage. And you continue that process until the entire mission is calculated. And then later when you start calculating multi-year maneuvers or reusable rockets or missions with maneuvers where you're dropping and picking up components for efficiency, the mission planning and calculation becomes a lot more challenging and a lot more fun. And that should be everything you need to set up and play leaving Earth.